This is part 16 in the Creed 7B Mark I Teleprinter restoration series. In this video I finally get around to looking at the keyboard. Now, the keyboard on this machine is not like a keyboard you'd find on a typewriter. There are no direct mechanical linkages between the keyboard and the teleprinter itself other than the keyboard requires a mechanical drive from the teleprinter. But the feedback is not through mechanical means. What the keyboard actually does is to take each key press and it will encode the key press as a series of electrical impulses that it will feed out through a set of electric contacts on the back of the transmitter unit. So this is actually the transmitter for the system. So you press a key and the result of that is a stream of zeros and ones that are encoded for that particular key. As I say, there are no mechanical outputs at all, other than one, which I'll come back to in another video, but that's not directly related to printing of the characters. So it's a fairly complex um, system, but it's self-contained, and you can actually use the teleprinter without one of these at all. If you just want to use it for a receiving station, then you don't need the keyboard fitted. And in fact, the keyboard is very easy to detach. There are just two screws that hold it in place, there's one at either end and if you take those out then the entire thing just uh, unplugs from the teleprinter and it can be easily removed or replaced. I'll just turn it round. So on the back we have a few parts to it. We have the central drive system that transmits power across the keyboard. It takes it to this side to drive the transmitter mechanism and it takes it to this end to drive the callback or identification mechanism which I'll explain in more detail in another video. It has other things on here as well such as this is just the counter, it's a character counter and it doesn't need this to work, this is just used to um, illuminate this light at a certain point when a certain number of characters have been entered for a particular line. It's kind of a warning that you're getting towards the end of a line. On this end we have the transmitter. Again, it's kind of a self-contained unit. It's fed by the five rods and levers on the keyboard itself. And then the interface between the entire keyboard and the rest of the teleprinter is just through these six contacts. And as I said, this just feeds um, data out of the transmitter and uh, into the teleprinter. There are two signals that come out of here. One is the actual data that's being transmitted and the other one is uh, start-stop information to start and stop the process within the teleprinter. On the bottom we also have another electrical connector and that is just for the uh, warning light. So that's I think uh, uh, an optional add-on that um, isn't required for the machine to work. So I intend to repaint the base on this, it's uh, quite scuffed up, it's been repainted quite a few times by the look of it at the front, so I've decided to completely strip this and repaint it. Um, I may as well do that anyway because this will not turn, it's, it's completely locked up, so um, I think there's quite a lot of work to do on this. It's, it does appear that the transmitter is uh, seized, um, the callback unit, uh, I'm not sure if that's seized as well because obviously the two are linked together so I can't turn one if the other one's seized up. So I'll start stripping this down. I'll do it off camera just because it's quite a, a lengthy and uh, involved process and it will probably get quite boring to watch the, the entire thing but um, once I've got it dismantled to a certain point I'll get back on camera and look at some of the components in more detail. Okay so that's the initial disassembly of the keyboard completed. Uh, I've got quite a nice collection of parts now strewn out on the bench and um, as I say I will go over what each one of these does in more detail as I get to it uh, but to start with I'll be looking at the main chassis. As I mentioned previously there are certain parts of the adjustments of this machine that are critical and although you could probably get them back again if you lost them I find it much easier to try and retain them rather than try to figure out 
where the starting point is for the overall adjustment. There are literally hundreds of adjustments and if you don't have a starting point it can get very difficult. So on here there are a couple of critical ones. So we have the pins uh, at this end which locate the bearing block and the answer back unit but the critical adjustments are these two plates there's one here and there's one here so before I take these off I'll be taking some fairly accurate measurements relative to some key points on the casting as to where these are and what angle they're at so I can put them back in the same place and that will give me a good starting point for uh, completing the adjustment when I come to reassemble the unit and the same with this bracket here I'll be measuring that fairly carefully before I take it apart uh, every other piece I've removed and I can now completely strip this and get it repainted as I did with the, um, the main chassis. I'll just quickly explain how the keyboard works. It's very clever. It works in an almost identical fashion to the uh, selector drum on the main unit in that what we have is a series of encoder bars the only difference between this and the selector drum is this is uh, linear, so imagine the selector drum unrolled then the mechanism works in exactly the same way. So what we have are five encoder bars. When you press a key, I don't know if you can see in the top of the encoder bars there are slots and they're all in uh, key positions within each bar. So when you press a key down, the bars, the selector bars move back and forth until they're all in such a position that the key will go all the way down and it will go into the relevant slots in each of the five bars. That then effectively locks those bars in place and that combination is unique for each key. The transmitter unit then senses the position of each of these bars in exactly the same way that the uh, selected drum does on the uh, main chassis and the transmitter then uses that to encode a series of pulses. I'll demonstrate the transmitter in a future video uh, but for now we'll just look at each of the parts briefly in turn. So these are quite nice, It's um, I will completely strip this down, it is uh, quite dirty and some of these are quite difficult to move so each of the keys can be fairly easily taken out. It's just a case of making sure they go back in the correct order. So to get these keys out, if you've never worked on one of these, all you do is you push the key down and pull it forward and then it will just pop out, keep hold of the spring so it doesn't disappear across the room and then uh, obviously it's fairly easy to clean and putting it back is just the reverse, you compress the spring, slide it into its correct location and make sure that the operating tab goes in the right place and then it's back in. You can take them all out as long as you keep track of which is which and bear in mind that on a lot of keyboards there are some non-use positions you need to make sure you don't get confused as to which key goes where uh, otherwise it uh, won't work because these do need to be in the correct location for each encoder bar and the same thing with the encoder bars if you do take them out they're all different so make sure they go back in in the same order they came out otherwise you'll get all sorts of uh, very odd uh, data coming out of the unit uh, I need to try and figure out what to do about the key caps. There's obviously um, corrosion got into there and uh, I need to get that sorted out uh, to make it look uh, more respectable. I'm hoping that the top of the caps will pop off. So that's the main keyboard encoder. We then have the transmitter. As I said I'll go over each of these in more detail uh, as I come to restoring each one. But this, as I say, works in a similar way to the drum selector for the characters on the printer. So each of these fingers um, is allowed to go down or not allowed to go down depending on the particular uh, sequence of bar positions that were selected with the key that was pressed. And then depending on what position these are in, as the mechanism goes across each of the five um, selectors, it opens or closes the contacts on the transmitter. So it will go from a mark to a space depending on what the position of each one is and then it runs through all five and creates the required uh, encoded sequence. Okay, so that's the transmitter. We have the counter unit that's used to count the characters. I'll look at that again later. 
uh, and then we have this unit. This is um, kind of a coding unit. It's when you're trying to send data to a remote terminal, quite often it's advantageous to be sure that you are sending data to the correct terminal. And that's especially true, bearing in mind the era that these were designed in and what a lot of them were used for. And although it's a, an optional add-on, what it does is it responds to a particular command coming into the printer, a particular byte value, and it's called an answer back unit. And the way it's used is these veins in this drum are set up in a unique pattern. And that unique pattern is used to set the fingers on the keyboard into a certain configuration, in other words, a certain binary value. And that, in theory, should be unique or at least recognisable for each terminal you're trying to identify. And then when the printer receives the answer back request character, it responds by using this drum as if there's somebody's pressing a key and that in turn sends back a coded value that the interrogator can then be sure is you answering and um, not somebody else. In other words, they've used it to identify your particular terminal so they can then be reasonably sure that they're sending data to the correct teleprinter. So again, I'll look at this in more detail in a future video. So that's it for this video. Um, my next step is to get the um, main part of this chassis stripped and repainted and then I will strip this unit down, get it cleaned up and reassembled and in the next video hopefully that will be done and then I'll go on to looking at the way the transmitter works in a bit more detail.